morning, everybody. Hi, everybody. Um, good morning. Welcome to our session, which needs a title, um, and we'll get to that in a second. My name is Goldie Blumenstick. I'm a senior writer at the Chronicle of Higher Education, known to some of you on Twitter, from the Twitter world as at Goldie Standard. Um, this is a very kind of a cool session we've got planned today. The point of this session is to impart some great information, but also to an, impart an idea. Uh, the idea being we want to sort of enliven education conferences a little bit more and give them a little more pep, I guess, in a way. So think of this as kind of a cross between your TED talk and your lightning talk, some time frame in the middle there. Um, I think it needs a title. I sort of, I was thinking of maybe talk about these as takeaway sessions because you know how when you go to a conference and you go to a panel and you're like so grateful when you walk out of that panel with one good takeaway? Well, we're just doing that. We're just getting rid of the panel part <laughs> and we're just going to go right to the really one good takeaway. We're going to make sure every session, every speaker who comes up to here today for five minutes gives you at least one good idea to walk out the door with and we're going to skip the fluffy part. We're just going to go right to the good idea. Um, so it's a new way of communicating and frankly, and I'm, up, I'm pleased to have the chance to introduce this because as we're speaking about new ways of communicating, I'm very happy to talk to you also about a new way of communicating that we're doing at the Chronicle of Higher Education where I've now worked for nearly 28 years. Most of them wonderful. Um, so oh, what, what we've done at the Chronicle, as many of you may know, is we've started this new, uh, we call it a reporting project, kind of in the vein of uh, what Planet Money's done with, after the economic crisis. We call it re-learning, re hyphen learning, mapping the new education landscape. And it comes out of a belief that we have at the Chronicle that we're at a very interesting moment in time in the, in the sort of the history of higher education and in the future of higher education where a lot of interesting forces are coming together. And we've now devoted a team of reporters, um, me, a colleague Jeff Young, and a few others on our staff who are writing about sort of this, this, in, this interesting moment where the forces of change are coming to bear on higher education. It's, make, it's leaving a lot of anxieties on the campus, some of them quite deserved, about some of the proposals that people have out there. It's more than though um, a new it's more than a beat. It's actually kind of a, a new way of thinking about how we communicate news. It's um, an experiment for us at the Chronicle in both form and in content because we're, um, we've created sort of a, spe a spe special page. There's a sheet here that kind of explains it all for you. But we've created a special page at the Chronicle that we call the relearning page. Um, we have a Facebook page where we're having discussions about some of our articles and other articles that other people are writing also because we, we realize we're not the only people who are, have smart things to say about this conversation. We have a Twitter handle, relearning um, edu. We have an interactive, we have a feature that we call, um, well, it, it needs a name too, actually. Um, it's a feature where we invite people to suggest story ideas or ideas for us to explore, and then we invite the readers to vote on these ideas, and we'll, the, the idea that comes up and wins, we'll go pursue that story and check it out. And most importantly, and kind of cool for me, we've started a new podcast channel. Um, you can actually find it on iTunes, relearning under iTunes. We've interviewed folks like Sal Khan and um, Jamie Cassop from, from uh, Google, and a bunch, Tyler Cowen, and a bunch more coming up in the next few weeks. So we're really excited about that, mostly because it's a great chance for, I've worked at the Chronicle, I said 28 years, my colleague Jeff's been there for more than 20, and frankly, we think we bring to this conversation um, a level of sophistication that this topic deserves. Um, we're not we're not, we don't have an agenda and we don't have an ideology about this thing. We do think we bring kind of a very strong understanding of the real concerns of the academy and also the language and the concerns of the reform movement that's trying to bring some changes to the academy. And we're trying to sort of create that balance there. So I'm really excited about it and I hope you'll all check us out along the way here. Um, I just personally, I should just add, it's been a really appropriate thing for me to be part of this project. So, as a lot of you know, I wrote a book about a year or a half ago. A lot of you have used it to help inform discussion on your campuses and in your companies, and thank you for that. I appreciate it. Um, but more so than that, it was a really important time for me to sort of take stock of where higher ed has been and where it's headed. And it's also the Chronicle of Higher Education's 50th birthday this year. Um, uh, Happy birthday to the Chronicle, thank you very much. Um, we've been running the old front pages of the Chronicle in the, in the print edition and online, and if you, I invite you to check that out also. also. And we just think it's sort of an important moment for the Chronicle and for, uh, to sort of recognize how this, this little pivot that higher education is taking right now. So with that, um, I want to introduce you now to our panel. We've all committed to keeping this tight and bright and hot. Um, and the first person up is going to be um, Kai Campbell, who's the provost from Morehouse College. Um, ready? All right, I'm giving you the mic. Yeah. 
So I hope my voice can stand. I'm just getting over bronchitis, so um, hopefully it'll stay for the full five minutes. Um, let me begin by saying that Morehouse College is a liberal arts institution. It has about 2,100 students. Um, about 50% of those students are Pell eligible. Uh, about 95% of our students are on some kind of financial aid. We are one of three all-male institutions in this country and the only historically black all-male institution in this country. Uh, our mission is to uh, develop men with disciplined minds, lead lives, of lead, lead lives of leadership and service by assuming a special responsibility for the teaching of the history and culture of black people. Um, that has been our mission for uh, almost 150 years, and we have graduated some of the most extraordinarily impactful uh, black men in the country, and I would dare say in the world, our most illustrious alum being uh, Martin Luther King Jr. Um, what I want to share with you today is really not about uh, innovation or technology, but it's a commentary. And it really boils down to three, three things. One is that we're in a terrible crisis. Two, that the solution is beyond technology. And that three, that there are magic equations. Son, the entire narrative of this country argues against the truth of who you are. Those words are, are, are written by ta Coates. And to say that we are in a terrible crisis is an understatement. For me, uh, to hear that black boys are suspended from school at over four times the rate of white students, to hear that uh, black children make up about a sixth of the preschool population, but make up over 50% of the suspensions at preschool. Um, that suggests that there's a systems failure. That is, we can add to that, that in all STEM disciplines, we would need to nearly quadruple the, the uh, percentage of graduation, the graduation rate um, for under, underrepresented minorities to equal, to even approach parity um, in their representation in the country. Add to that, in addition to the gaps and all of the other, uh, other things, other statistics that I think everyone in this room is probably pretty familiar with, add to that, that we are, we are living in this context of Ferguson, of Baltimore, of Cleveland, of, of Chicago. A um, place like Ferguson, for example, for every 100 black women aged 25 to 54 who isn't incarcerated, there are only 60 such black men. That comes from the, the piece, The Missing Black Men in the New York Times. In my view, this, this country is experiencing a crisis unlike or at least equal to any other crisis it has had in, this, in our history. And at Morehouse, we see this crisis as being a part of our work. This is what we do. We don't just graduate students. We graduate young men who are prepared to work in and, and, uh, and against these realities. Um, that is our real objective. That's what we're after. And Undeniably, getting students to graduate is an important part of that. And so, of course, we deploy, we are, we're deploying some uh, predictive analytics tools. We're deploying um, some, some technologies that will help us do better with advising, to reach out to students earlier. We're doing all of those technology things. But I wanted to say today that, in fact, the thing that I find most important, the most important contribution that we have uh, made in this, in this, um, in this area is, is really reflected in a comment that a faculty of mine said, it's Professor David Wall Rice, Associate Professor of Psychology, said, we do this work, we can do this work because we think differently, fundamentally differently about black boys and black men, their potential, their strengths, and their possibility. Our approach is to help our young men hear the sound of the genuine, not to see them as deficient or broken in need of being fixed, but full of potential, of gifts and genius, waiting to be discovered, engaged, and amplified. This way of thinking, as I said, is our most important and most critical contribution against this crisis. Son, the entire narrative of this country argues against the truth of who you are. That is Ta-Nehisi Coates. The, net, the crisis is that narrative, and the genius is the truth of who our students are. We've begun to think about how to actualize this in something called passion plus gifts. I won't have time to talk about it, but it's really 
identifying with students' passions, and then the gifts is an acronym, growth mindset, identity liberation, flow, time, and space. We're working to combine all of these things to create the right kind of environment to actualize everywhere across our entire campus that notion that every student has a genius within them. It is our job to get that, get that out. Kai, Kai, stay for a second. Just one quick question. I'm going to try to hit this up with everybody here. Um, you said it, t technology is not really the answer, but you serve an institution, um, black men. Uh, from this audience, not from this audience, but from this, uh, this kind of attendee list, what's the one thing, if it's not technology, what's the one thing that you could, that would be helpful coming from a collection of people at, like, like at this conference? The one thing that I would want to say to, to, to those Well, the one thing that you could get back from them, yeah. So, I mean, this idea that you can change your mindset, your way of thinking about students, it doesn't cost anything, it doesn't, it doesn't require any new technology, but it is a fundamentally difficult, incredibly challenging thing to, to uncover. It requires some unrest, it requires some uncomfortability, um, but in fact, that's the thing that, that no technology can solve that we really have to work hard at. Okay, great, thanks. We'll have some time at the end, hopefully, for some questions as well, but we want to keep it moving at the moment here. Um, Angeline. Angeline. This is Angeline Godwin, from, um, who's the president right, at Patrick Henry Community College. And let's hear it. No wrong door. And we have found that that is the key to our student success. No wrong door. I'm Angela Godwin, the president of Patrick Henry Community College in Martinsville, Virginia. We have the highest unemployment in the entire Commonwealth, and I serve uh, high schools that, in fact, have 100% free and reduced lunches. So for us, it's about finding every door to be the right door and every person to be the right person for that student every day. And those are simple words, but it's really a very tough reality. Patrick Henry Community College is a part of Achieving the Dream Reform Network. We began as a leader college in 2004. And so we understand that data is our friend. And we understand that every single student is more than a data point. But that data point is key for us understanding how we connect, reconnect, how students join with us, engage with us, but sometimes they disconnect and that we really not, we create wraparound services for our students that do not bind them or disenfranchise them or harm them, but in fact serve them. We're like many institutions, and what we discovered is we had silos, siloed departments that really didn't know what each other did. We had scattered services throughout our college, and more importantly, with our many initiatives trying to do the right thing, to make students successful, we discovered that in fact what we had done is we had an intake process for every single program. The secret to our success and our work for true student success is that we began to create a central intake for all of our student achievements. So we created a student success center with no money. Uh, it is both physical and virtual. Uh, on no money budget, we had one of our individuals create a program called My Compass. That's our school logo. And we connected into our Starfish program in which when we process a student and intake into any program, it opens them up to every academic service. But what is more important, it opens them up to every community service. Everything that we have in our entire community, whether it's child care, whether it's health care, whether it's transportation, lodging. We have a lot of students with food insecurities. Whatever it may be, we bring all of those community services to our students. We don't send them out to find it on their own. And it's been a major turning point for us. So in addition to the Learning Resource Center, the library, math tutoring, tutoring center, writing center, library. We have a program for reentry students coming out of incarceration. We have a program for foster kids. 2% of a child who's ever been in foster care will graduate from college. We have an 84% retention rate with those students. GED students, we bring them right into the mainstream of the college. 85% completion rate. We know 
that the way we create a success mindset for our students and the access we give them to all of the services that they need is a major turning point for the students. So, a student's success is everybody's business. It's everybody's job. And we went from some wrong doors to this is not my job to there's no, there's no wrong door on our campus and every person on our campus is the right person at the right time to take every student to where they need. And we will not be satisfied until there are no barriers to our students being successful. This is our life's work. We've got to get off career ladders. And we've got to get off ambition tracks. This is our life's work. No wrong door. Thank you. Angel, that's, um, everyone just pause for a second. Students coming from high schools with 100% of students on, on free and reduced lunch. That's quite a student population. When it's everybody's job, sometimes it can be nobody's job. How, I mean, and that's the case for all kinds of organizations, and here it's particularly critical. How do you make sure that it's some, still somebody's job? I, I think the difference Use is... Use the mic, maybe. I think the difference is... Really, somewhat what Jim Collins said this morning, we have broken it down into individual uh, areas of responsibility where people say, I am good at this. I have a passion for this. I will drive this part for these students. We've also built small cohorts of students. So for 20 students, it may truly be my job to start them from the first day to the finish line. And so I think you have to break it down into what he called a 20 mile march, but we break it down to small pieces of success that everybody can feel pride and ownership and, and really have that responsibility. So you're right, it's not just an everybody do whatever, it's that I personally am engaged in the success of these students, whatever group or whatever uh, grouping or cohort that might be. Great, thanks. Our next talk comes from Hans van der Schaaf, Senior Project Manager at Portland State University. Take it. Great. Good morning. Thank you for having me. Hans van der Schaaf from Portland State University. I'm also joined by my colleague Randy Harris as well. Um, the two key takeaways that I'd like you to have from my presentation or talk this morning are that one, a focus on execution matters when working and innovating around using technology as it relates to student success and educational transformation and that the experience of students in terms of the services they access matters as well. So first, execution. The principles and strategies related to execution I'll talk about in a minute are, are critical, we feel, when developing innovations. We're here at a conference. There are lots of really great shiny objects. Those shiny objects provide a lot of potential for us, but that much of the work is how we integrate those great tools into our organizational performance and change. Secondly, the student experience and the services that students access is incredibly important to reducing barriers and improving uh, their chances in, in attainment and graduation. And that we, we have to choose where we want to be good. That in public institutions we have in some ways infinite needs, but we have to be very strategic about where we deploy our resources and excel in those areas. Many of you have a copy of the roadmap. I'll walk you through the areas where we're putting our money, where we think we can make a difference for students. So first, we're uh, working on an initiative called Advising Redesign where we're creating a centrally uh, located and unified advising framework um, that's overseen centrally. And the goal is to create consistent advising practices and policies in a, policies in a decentralized institution. Secondly, in this advising work, uh, we want to enhance the one-to-one -one relationship between advisors and students by creating academic advising pathways or clusters that are consistent with the way that students move through our institutions and are different than a focus on school or college or in some ways even major. One of the second initiatives we're moving forward at the same time is called Interactive Degree Maps. It's a dynamic, mobile-friendly tool that we think will help students make proactive decisions around academic and financial planning. It was selected as the finalist at the APLU Innovation Pitch Challenge in November 2015. Third, redesign of MyPSU. We're creating a single point of entry for student online services and resources and connecting students with the PSU community. <coughs> Fourth, we're building a coordinated service network that will leverage EAB's 
campus platform to enable smooth and effective referrals across advising, registrar's office, financial aid, and academic support. Quickly, the mindsets and principles that underscore our work are incredibly important to how we go about this change. First, a service to students and designing around their needs, leaving our own biases and ideas really behind and allowing that user-centered focus to emerge. It also go along, goes along with his people being empathetic and designing for those students. A focus on execution, I'll talk a little bit about that in a minute, being agile, nimbly experimenting, rapid learning, prototyping, making mistakes early so that we can get those big wins down the road. And finally, the ability to be open-minded to accept influence from others. The last piece I'll talk about is our strategies, how we go about doing this work. First, we focus on crowdsourcing of ideas. In 2013, we launched an initiative with $3 million in funding called the Provost Challenge, where we crowdsourced 162 proposals from 1,000 faculty and staff that resulted in 24 projects uh, to accelerate the use of online learning and the use of technology to improve student success. As we look at our work moving forward, we're going to be using a tool called User Voice to help us solicit student feedback at a large scale across our 28,000 students on the features that they think will be the most useful for the technologies that we're deploying. And we're also in the beginnings of thinking through how to use Net Promoter Score to help us understand the value that we're providing students when it comes to delivery of service. Second strategy is around the use of project management. It's a formalized execution of work. As a project manager, my colleagues, we're collaborators, we're schedule keepers, we're Gantt makers, we're thought partners. We make sure at the end of the day that the work gets done and that in doing so we balance people, project, and mission. Last, I'm sorry, second to last, design thinking and human-centered design approach. It goes along some of the, the principles we talked about, about rapid learning, prototyping, and taking an approach that really puts students at the center of our work. And finally, service design, where we're consciously focusing on the improvement and design of services with technology as a critical backbone. So in closing, back to the two key, takeaway, two, the two key takeaways, a focus, a focus on execution, and also that the student experience matters. Thank you. Hans, step for second. Sure. <laughs> I'm intrigued by this, the way to measure student experience because I think that's very rarely done on a campus. I mean, except maybe in like a net promoter score and yeah. possibly in that same obnoxious way that the telephone company calls you back and makes you answer their question after you spend an annoying hour with them on the yeah. phone. But how does, so how does this thing work? It's a, great, it's a great question. We're in the very early stages of figuring it out. Um, I mean, we're, like you said, we don't know of other models of people that are doing it rigorously throughout their enterprise. And so we're in the midst of, literally, we have a, a conference call next week with some colleagues um, from Qualtrics that help us figure out how to go ahead and... But, and why did you decide to, I mean, was there something that you said, oh, we should maybe ask the students? Well, yeah, because we, our, our theory of change, if you will, is that how they're experiencing accessing services is a critical part in their ability to be retained and graduate and that they're leading indicators that help us get to those longer term KPIs that were measured on. The, the time horizons on those are really long. So how do we get something that's earlier term to help us assess whether we're making an impact or not? Considering that they're only there for four years or exactly. six years. Six years, right. yeah. yeah. Great. Great, thanks. Thank you. <laughs> Next up is Julie Schell from, um, who's from the University of Texas at Austin. Um, take it away. Thank you. Technology. So my takeaway for you today is unbundle. At every opportunity, unbundle. And I'm, before I go into detail about what I mean by that, I want to start by introducing you to a high school junior who is very close to me. Born and raised in Las Vegas, Nevada. She's a member of the National Honor Society, a three-letter athlete, officer of the yearbook. She attends a college prep school the daughter, daughter of a farmer come electrician. She aces college algebra, or sorry, she aces high school algebra and does well in pre-cal the next year. Excited to attend the state flagship, she has her sights set on medical school. Because of APs, she's got a half of semester of college under her belt. Wanting at least one easy A, she enrolls in college algebra despite getting an A in pre-cal. No one stops her. That vision of wearing a white coat dances in her head as she believes she has ensured a 4.0 her first semester. Then the report card hits and reality comes crashing down in blazes with a C versus an easy A. 
That C in a lower division course is the kiss of death for a young co-ed's dream of medical school. Forced to switch majors, five years, and tens of thousands of dollars in student debt, she gets a bachelor's in pre-med besides no chance of wearing that white coat. She's close to me because she is me. And this was 22 years ago, even though it sounds like it just came out of the newspaper headlines today. Now the contrived part here is I made it. I've done just fine, but I'm an outlier. Then and today, most kids don't. Indeed, 91% of other Nevadans just like me, 85% of Texans, 80% of Californians, and 80% of Americans nationwide either don't get on or jump off the college completion train. That's right, 91% of Nevadans who finish ninth grade never finish an associate's or a bachelor's degree within 150% of degree time. Of course, the outrageously low completion rates in the US are no secret to you, but few, few people know how bad the situation really is and how stubbornly resistant to change and careful reform efforts it's been. I introduce my story to you, adding their, our national completion tragedy dis, uh, to point out that despite substantial investments and in innovation in college completion, history just keeps repeating itself. If we want to break cycles of poverty, attend to our national security, maintain the core of our identities of, as Americans, we can no longer wait to come up with new ideas and innovations to improve post-secondary degree attainment. And I think technology and unbundling offers a solution. Some of the most promising completion interventions are those that leverage the immersion theory that help, helping students experience college before college will increase their chances of completion. Advanced placement launched in 1955 is an example. Since the late 1990s, dual credit interventions have also exploded. <clears throat> and few college immersion programs hold the true promise of dual credit. Indeed, in Texas, just taking one dual credit course in high school doubles, a ch chance, doubles the chances of a student enrolling and completing a degree within six years. Unfortunately, dual credit is the province of only a limited few. Less than 8% of the 1.5 million high school students in Texas access dual credit each year. Access barriers make it difficult for all students to participate in immersive college experiences early, and such programs are facing mounting quality control concerns. I propose that one reason for the lack of a sea change here may be that historical college immersion interventions have not fully embraced the innovative technology solutions that broaden access, control quality, and spark educational change. But what if they did? What if there was a way to equalize and increase access to these promising interventions? A way to diffuse early <clears throat> immersive college opportunities and ensure quality experiences for all, no matter where they live or who they are? What if there was a way to empower, support, and develop public school teachers to transform their classrooms with rigorous college level academics and create widespread change in our public education system? At Texas OnRamps, we've adopted the experience college before college value tr proposition and taken it to heart. But we've hacked it to become more disruptive using technology. Indeed, technology to shape access is our killer app and our differentiator from other historical early college immersion interventions. Texas OnRamps is a dual enrollment program which began in 2011 at UT Austin. Instead of one class, one teacher, and one credit, Dual enrollments uh, through on-ramps means students are enrolled separately in a high school course, in a high school course, and separately in a college course with two different teachers, but a standardized, rigorous curriculum. We use technology to unbundle the high school and the college credit from each other, and unbundling the high school and the college teaching as well through a facilitated network that reshapes early college immersion opportunities for students, teachers, and their schools. When you ask people what they find inspiring about Texas OnRamps, they say, quote, it provides all students the opportunity to get a glimpse of what it takes to be successful in college, and it inspires teachers to transform their classrooms and schools. OnRamps has the power to cut across socioeconomic strata in a way that is deeply inspiring. And finally, quote, OnRamps gives teachers a support system to keep the rigor high. Instead of kids learning functions by rote, we have kids building actual physical model roller coasters using calculus. To see my kids this engaged in advanced mathematics is simply amazing. How does Texas OnRamps work? Through a robust technology infrastructure that's supported by UT Austin. A cloud-based learning management system delivers curriculum designed, vetted, and monitored by UT Austin faculty to thousands of students regardless of their zip code. 
Local high school teachers trained by and paired with UT Austin faculty and staff are responsible for evaluating students for the provision of high school credit and a university fac faculty member separately delivers online instruction and is responsible for the evaluation of students for the provision of college credit. They receive separate feedback and separate grades from their high school teacher and their college instructor. A student may receive an A on their essay from their high school teacher and a C from their college professor. As such, both students and their high school teachers have a sustained year-long experience with exposure to the often vast differences between high school and college expectations. So far, Texas OnRamps has served 6,000 students and 100 teachers in 70 high schools throughout the state of Texas, and our goals are to reach 10,000 students in, with 10 courses over the next two years. In closing, Texas OnRamps has shaped educational opportunity and quality and the diffusion thereof using technology. I hope you will visit onramps.org to learn more about how onramps works and join us in our effort to stop history from repeating itself because any student or teacher can participate in onramps, regardless of where they're coming from, their zip code, their race or ethnicity, or their socioeconomic status. At UT, our motto is what starts here changes the world. With Texas onramps, I think we're on to something. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks. I'm going to hold my, you went over your time limit, so I'm going to hold my question for the end there, but we're going to, when I promise everyone we're going to keep this moving here, but we do have a few for you as well. Um, next up is Sue Blanchin, Senior Advisor to the Provost at Michigan State University. Thank you very much. It's great to be here. I want to talk with you today about how we were manage, how we managed to uh, lower the number of first-generation low-income students who were on academic probation after their first semester by 27 percent in a three-year time period. The answer to that is a fairly complex answer in some ways and very simple in others. What we did was we created what we call neighborhoods, which are innovative wraparound networks of academic support services for students in five geographic areas of the campus so that a student does not have to walk two miles or take a bus a mile and a half across campus to see an advisor and then backtrack uh, half a mile to get academic tutoring in math and then cross another mile to go to the health clinic because they're coming down with a cold. We have all of those services located in engagement centers in each of the five neighborhoods so that we have cross-functional teams whose job is to support every student's academic success. When we began the neighborhoods, we created the cross-functional collaboration that has seen us through to today that is so important and some of colleagues have talked about that. So that on a weekly basis, a team of an academic advisor, a health practitioner, a coach, a fitness instructor, a nutritionist consultant, sit around a table and look at the data that we provide them from uh, predictive uh, analytics sources and surveys on student behavior and attitudes and they see where a student may be about to trip up and, and get off their academic path and they design individually focused interventions for those students. Now that's not very efficient you say. That's true and we don't stop there but what we do is we say we don't have at-risk students. Our institution is at risk if a student falters. And so it's the institution's job and responsibility to figure out how to be creative and how to intervene on behalf of the students when the institution hasn't offered something that the student needs. We also have created what we call Spart a Spartan Success Scholars Program. And that program is focused on all first year first generation low income students. And in addition to all of the services provided in the five neighborhoods, we have added peer coaching, professional mentoring, specific programs designed about how to address and, and be knowledgeable about transitions to college and how to use university resources in the neighborhoods. We do track utilization and we use that data to inform how individual and groups of students are doing. 
And it is from those student success scholars that we have seen that 27% drop in the number of students on probation after their first semester. Now, why is that so important? Because if you go at Michigan State, if you're on probation at the end of your first semester, you have only a third of a chance to graduate. A third of a chance. So it's crucial that we intervene early. The other thing that we've done is we've moved from reactive to proactive interventions. For example, in the last two summers with our academic orientation program, we worked with David Yeager at UT Austin and Greg Walton at Stanford on a Carol Dweck-based uh, intervention that's an online intervention of mindset and a um, social belonging intervention for our students. And so as our students arrive on campus, they've already had an intervention that we are believing and hoping and praying and we've seen evidence is helping them do better, get better grade point averages, persist more semesters, persist to their second year, and they're on a track for timely, successful uh, commencement. So my takeaways for you today are that you have to be singularly focused on helping students. You do it one student at a time and you do it collective students at a time when your data points tell you that certain characteristics put students in jeopardy. You work proactively and reactively. Uh, you tailor interventions within flexible structures so that, you know, we're not rigid silos anymore, but we, we broke down the silos and we moved people to five locations where they collaborate with, they're accountable to peers. And finally, the cross-functional um, teams is, is very important and, and colleagues have also talked about that. So with that, I'll conclude. And my timer's up. <laughs> she hit her buzzer right there on the buzzer. That's awesome. So Sue, so while politics is local, apparently all advising is local also. Um, but how do you sort of um, keep those, those five neighborhoods or whatever from being so, somewhat siloed? Is there, uh, you know, there's, oh, there's some advantages to centralizing information also. Now that they're all five different places, how do you keep the communications? Well, we don't mind if neighborhoods take on uh, somewhat distinctive cultures because that happens. And so we, we view that as a, a rich opportunity. But we regularly bring together the colleagues from the, the various neighborhoods into a collective um, meeting every, I think it's every two weeks so that we have engagement directors from each of the neighborhoods and they come together and collaborate. We're also probably going to move to a model where um, the engagement directors, as colleagues have, have said here, would be more specialists. They have expertise and knowledge. They're really good on advising. Somebody else is really good on coaching. Somebody else is really good on STEM interventions. And so they'll lead the work for all of the neighborhoods in those expertise areas. And you've, have you seen the different neighborhoods develop different personalities, actually? Yes, somewhat. Okay, cool. Yeah, okay, great. Um, great, thanks. And uh, oh. I have colleagues here who distribute a handout. I didn't cover the points necessarily on the handout. Business cards are available. Thank you. Great. Okay, our last formal presentation now is from um, Kara Van Dam, the Vice Provost from University of Maryland Un University College. Thank you. Um, uh, so according to the College Board, the average annual cost for textbooks for U.S. undergrads is about $1,200 a year. And there was a 2012 uh, study by Florida Virtual Campus that found that 60% of students at one point or another have foregone buying textbooks because of the cost. And in fact, they also have uh, taken fewer classes. So educational costs are not simply sort of the actual cost of the money, but uh, the lack of you know, students' willingness to pay these costs or the lack of their ability to pay these costs actually do um, delay progress and uh, increase student debt. So UMUC, the University of Maryland University College, we are the nation's largest open, open access public online university. We have 85,000 students, so we're big. Um, <laughs> And uh, we saw the move towards open educational resources as natural to our mission. And thus in 2013, we embarked on an ambitious an initiative to, by this year, replace all textbooks with open educational resources across our university. So these, these uh, materials, importantly, these learning resources would be provided to our students at no cost. So what are open educational resources or OERs? 
Well, ideally, they are fully open in the text sense, meaning that they are modifiable. But they're also open in the sense that they are Creative Commons licensed for public use. At a minimum, they are available at no cost to students. Um, that doesn't mean there isn't a cost to the institution. We may be pulling a learning resource from a library database, and there is a subscription to that. We may be developing material, our faculty may be. And so there are development costs associated with authoring the content ourselves. OERs also span all media. Some are text, some are videos, some are podcasts, simulations, games, labs, or open source software. We at UMUC actually believe that these OERs better support student learning. They aren't just the same as. We think it's better. And we have engaged in internal research to validate that, in addition to reducing students' cost of attendance. They have forced, as academics, our close attention towards ensuring resources that are high quality, that are accessible, and that are supportive of student success. And to put a fine point on it, it is a lot more work to curate these OERs than it is to pick a textbook. So we didn't do this because it was easy. Now, I do want to talk about the financial savings that our students have reaped. But as an academic, I want to further argue why I think this approach is transformative and critical for the benefit of our students' learning and for future students. And so if I have a takeaway, it is this. I want you all to think about the last thing that you were curious about. We're a curious bunch. We wouldn't be here if we weren't. It might be Tesla's plans for expansion. Uh, it might be the tiny house movement. Um, it might be the you know, new Apple car um, or the fact that season six of Game of Thrones is starting really soon and that's really awesome. For me, one of the things that has captivated my interest in the last year or so is World War I. Not as cool as Game of Thrones, but there you go. Now, 20 years ago, this curiosity would have driven me right down the street to my local community college, and I would have signed up for a class, you know, on early, uh, early 20th century history. I would have bought the book. I would have gone to the lecture. In fact, I did that. I took a class like that 20 years ago. But today, it drives me to listen to Hardcore History's brilliant podcast series on World War I. It's about 23 hours and gripping throughout. It drives me to watch the PBS documentary, The Great War, to engage in the Imperial War Museum of London's crowdsourced recreation of the lives of British soldiers on their website. And today, your curiosity drives you to articles on Tech Insider, to the Code Academy, or to the Khan Academy, to blogs, do-it-yourself, tiny house user forums, the HBO Go app, and more. Now, I ask you, how on earth are we going to justify to our digital native students why in every other area of their curious lives they learn the way I just described, but yet in college they have to sit in a lecture and, drive and read a textbook. They will be right to see this as a glaring disconnect, and it is not one that I wish to try to justify any longer. So to wrap up, some numbers. UMUC completed this initiative for all undergraduates in fall of 2015, and our graduate courses are on track to be completed this fall. Because of this initiative, in 2015 alone, our undergraduate students did not have to spend $17 million. $17 million. That's $17 million that now they can spend towards everything else important in their life without sacrificing their learning. And that, my friends, is pretty tremendous. Thank you. Great. Thanks. Kara, you talked. You kind of, I wouldn't say you glossed over, but you kind of mentioned very quickly this is a lot of work for faculty and others to Absolutely. curate that. So let's talk about that for a minute more because obviously that's one of the biggest barriers for OER adoption right now. People don't trust it necessarily, or even if they do trust it, it's not that easy to make it happen. So right. can you just give us another minute or so on what, how have you sort of made that barrier easier for your faculty to overcome? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think there are a couple things. One is when we, when we do a course, and we have a more standardized curriculum than, than many universities, and that does you know, benefit us in this pro process. But when we would convert a course, we would work with a core faculty member or a core set of faculty. We would partner them with an instructional designer. We would partner them actually with librarians um, to help them research the space, would really become experts in the open educational space so they'd know what was out there. I'll tell you one of our first tries we just said faculty go find stuff and it did not work very well they didn't know where to look and quite frankly why should they right, right? Um, and so it really is a team and now that team as we as we do uh, convert the courses 
They look through the learning outcomes. They look through the learning topics that are necessary in that class. The researchers go find the materials, bring it back to the faculty members. The faculty members go through it um, to curate it and determine what they need and what the gaps are. And then we determine how to fill the gaps. And often it's our own, you know, our faculty members authoring content that we support that way. Cool, great, thanks. Thank you so much. Hey, we did it. So we have five minutes left to go here. So it gives us all a few, time, few minutes for some questions. And there's also, um, I don't think we have a mic to pass around, so I'm just going to ask you to stand up, yell out your question really loud, and we'll either direct it to the right person on the panel here, the woman in the, with the cool flower in her. Okay. So, uh, you have taken away a revenue stream for your faculty. How did you, because now it's OER, how did you get that moment? Okay. So the question was, uh, by using OER, um, UMUC um, is taking away a, a revenue stream for the faculty if that faculty member was the person assigning the book, right, their own textbook which isn't not necessarily always the case. But. Right, and, and, and I would say, okay, didn't sound like it for a second. Um, so I would say part of it is we are a very different university. Our faculty are not generally authoring textbooks. We have scholar practitioner faculty. We have a lot of professional programs. So for example, we have a huge cybersecurity program that has won many global awards. Um, our cybersecurity faculty, most of them work at the NSA during the day. <laughs> they're not writing right? books. Right? All right. They're not and writing books. <laughs> so they're not writing books, right? And that's my point. So we don't have the majority of our faculty were not gaining a lot of revenue by writing textbooks. In fact, they were getting arrested if they were writing a book. Yes. Right. Um, <laughs> any other questions? Um, um, I had one um, for Portland State. Um, you said before that you like to fail fast. And that's part of it, iterate and fail fast. Can you give us an example of a fail fast? I know that's a hard one, right? Yeah, I mean, it, Tom. sorry, Tom. Uh, it, it doesn't happen at a grand scale. I think that's the point, right? It's <laughs> through our work in engaging students and staff in our innovations that we continually, we're, learn, we're learning really quickly. So one of the activities we're doing for our interactive degree maps project in the next 10 days is we're bringing students in to do uh, a card sorting activity where they identify the features and design criteria for the tool that would create the most value for them. And by getting that feedback in that structured way, it allows us to get some really good data. And then further on in the project, we're doing some prototyping and concepting and taking those ideas to students for feedback as well. And those concepts, the project team uh, will sit around and draw those up and take them for so feedback. So some will fly and some will die. So it's very low tech to get mm -hmm. to a high tech solution. Okay, and Julie, um, dual, the, the, you, the quality control issue in um, Dual degree programs is not a small piece either. There's a lot of concern in the higher ed faculty about who's teaching these high school courses. Um, and can you just talk for a second or two about how you address that very real concern that people have, in, particularly in certain disciplines? Sure, absolutely. So the way that we address that is that uh, we train our high school teachers to uh, deliver and teach the high school portion of our courses, but we match them with a university faculty member on our campus and a, and a staff member who follows them throughout the year. So it's not just a summer professional development institute where they come in and then go off on their own and, and teach a class. Um, we train them and, and work with them and uh, meet with them constantly, do site visits and really focus on that fidelity of implementation. It's really a partnership between the high school member and the faculty member. Our college faculty who are responsible for the provision of the college credit are approved UT faculty. So that's how we kind of do that. It, it's the unbundling that allows us to do that. Okay, great. One more quick question. Go, fast. Okay, and I think uh, it, it is uh, not only an intervention, but it's a research project. So it does have a control group, treatment group, so that we're validating, you know, the findings as we as we go, so, and the, it will be widely shared. Yeah. And I think Carol Dweck is speaking today, actually at three o'clock. Also, yes. so um, well, cool. I'm going to um, join me for a minute now in thanking Kai, Angeline, Hans, Julie, Sue, Kara. <laughs> um, Glad you, glad you all came. Grab them. We have a bunch, bunch of materials for you to take home. It's, none of it's too heavy, you know. Um, and we appreciate your coming. Thanks a lot. <laughs>